All right, so we're here at Eastern's at the end of the day, day one, Saturday. We saw some exciting games today. I'm Brian Jones here with Zach Smith, Jonathan Neely. Uh, you guys get to watch most of Pool A. I didn't get to see any of that today. Tell me how Pittsburgh and Florida and Illinois looked. I came out in the morning and Pittsburgh and Florida were playing. Florida was up four to two at the time. And um, most people, I think, right now would expect Pittsburgh to steamroll Florida. Florida's not looked great this season. They're young. They've graduated most of their playmakers. And Pittsburgh has just been on fire in 2012. Florida was hanging in the game. Um, they were finding ways to get turns on Pitt's, uh, Pitt's O-line. Some of Pitt's set plays weren't working. And they were finding ways to get the disc in the end zone. Uh, they were cleaning up slop on hucks. And um, they took half, eight to seven. Am I correct on that? I would say yes. And uh, then Pitt wound up just putting together a better second half. Florida stopped getting open downfield. They really struggled once Pitt started fronting and pushing them out. They didn't have the, the deep throws to punish that type of defense. Um, and Pitt's defense carried them. That, that really did. Their offense in the end zone looked sloppy on both the D and the O ends of things. But uh, they had enough legs and it got enough turns to make it work. Yeah, uh, just going off based what uh, Neely said, I spoke to Nick Kazmarek, the head coach of Pittsburgh, and he was saying how the defense for Pittsburgh has been the best it's been all season. And we saw them at warm-up, and, and it looked very impressive, in, in my opinion. Their, their defense looked uh, very strong. And he was saying that the fact that their defense was looking so good, they were able to steamroll California San Diego. They had three rounds in a row, so that pool went by very fast. Illinois was able to beat basically manhandle Florida 14 to 8 a team that looked like they weren't really clicking they didn't really have Travis Catron was was playing fantastic he has some of the best throws to space in my opinion some of the best field vision it doesn't seem like he has a lot of help there and it, it just their their style of offense just wasn't clicking it wasn't able it wasn't enough to beat these teams and, and Illinois able to take second in that pool with Florida taking third I also talked to Cass Merrick, and he was saying specifically that Florida was the only team that was able to shut down both Max and Alex Thorne as a duo, the only team so far this season. The thing about Pittsburgh's defense and why Cass Merrick would say that is that Stanford invite, Pittsburgh really couldn't force a break when they needed to when the game counted. So that's great for them to see that defense is, is coming up and coming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, final point on, on point A, talking about Florida. I've always thought that Florida is a very well-coached team. The way that they organize themselves is, is admirable. And I talked to Kyle Van Elk and their coach, and right now it's kind of all about teaching their new players to be where they need to be, to space the field properly, and you know know what the play should look like. And then it's a waiting game to see who's going to step up and turn into a playmaker. They've had a lot of those over the last last few years. You know, Tim Gary, Brody Smith, Kurt Gibson, they're in the conversation for best players in the world, right? Florida doesn't have that right now. And so Kyle, as the coach, it's it's patience. It's teaching them to do what what they need, how the field should be spaced and how the play should look, and waiting for someone to step up, letting guys figure out their roles and how they can become playmakers. Moving on to Pool B, we saw some exciting games, probably the closest pool at all. Almost all games went to Universe or were within two of some sort. Starting off the day, Tufts took down UNC on Universe, and really the story there was Thomas Samercourt going off in the first half, having something like seven assists and two goals. It was, it wow. was amazing. And he also, on defense, Pushing Alex Cooper upfield, and Alex Cooper is the type of guy in Tufts, as you guys also saw, that around the legs to touch disc every other. And when he doesn't, Tufts takes a while to adjust, and really Adrian Banerjee came out of his shell, not really out of his shell, he's played for Ironside, but got healthy the first time he had a PCL tear, and he played great for them, and, and then you guys got to watch him versus Ohio. We got to watch them against Ohio, and we got to watch them against Virginia, and a game that looked like Virginia was going to be able to, to walk away with it in, in very exciting fashion. A couple steps to the break side, and, and Virginia could have won that game, but Tufts able to break upwind to win both games, and really, really showed composure, and really showed, that, you know, we were, just, we were talking about this during the stream, we were saying that if Tufts wants to show that they're that, that top five team, they need to start coming out and beating teams 15 to seven, 15 to six. But the fact that they're, they, they, they find themselves down in these situations, down to Virginia, down 13-11 to Ohio, going upwind, able to pull out those victories in strong fashion, uh, they, they scored four in a row to beat Ohio. It, it, they're, they're a top-level team because they're able to get it done when it truly matters. And though they can't really assert themselves to be this d dominant force, you know, three games today, they'll still be fresh for tomorrow. Uh, you know, my take on, on Pool B, obviously the close games just showed, I, I think all four teams, um, they're in different places as far as what, what they're bringing onto the field, but they all came and put their best foot forward today. Um, you know, talking back about UNC, Thomas Terry McCord, he's a fun player to watch because of the tempo he plays at. He's one of those guys that 
can play looking like he's he's moving very slowly, but it's actually just that he's so in control and he turns, he throws very deliberately to space. You don't see him force it into traffic very much. He's big, he's good in the air, so people have to back him, respect him going deep, and he uses the space in front of him really well. Um, Alex Cooper, same way. He plays at a rhythm kind of that that fits his his physique and fits the throws that he's able to make. And it's all about getting defenders off balance. He's fun to watch for that reason. Um, and then going back to you know the teams on the whole, Tufts has been looking to, to do more than just play zone on defense they talked about. So there were some, some hiccups there. Uh, they've got an injured handler out, so there's even more load on Cooper, but um, they came out hard. Ohio is a team that last year looked pretty good, and they didn't lose too many people, and they had a disappointing finish to the 2011 season, but they really look like a squad that knows its pieces, knows what each teammate likes to do, where deep looks are coming from, who's going to throw the break throws, you know, who's going to help them out if their man goes deep on D. They look very cohesive. Virginia, um, you know, as a Virginia alum, I was worried coming into this weekend. They've got a lot of injuries. Uh, they had a lot of playmakers graduate last year, and people are still figuring out roles. And this past week at, at practice, I know attendance was low and intensity wasn't very good. Um, they had a number of freshmen and sophomores step up. Their sidelines were in the game. They lost three games by a total of four points. Um, and I think a lot of people would have expected worse out of them. And, and they did a good job of, of focusing on specifics to work on through games. You know, marks, uh, sideline defense, um, making adjustments. They did a good job of that. And um, it was good to see them, you know, take away uh, what is a tough day, three losses, knowing that it actually made them a better team. So I, this is a very exciting pool to keep an eye on. Pool B going to C, just like Pool A, and we move on to Pool C, and we saw a lot of competition there, especially Central Florida was out, was without Mishka Freistadter. Got to see that game, and that was a, a barn burner versus UNCW, where it was just Wilmington likes to dictate, dictate the pace. That's what Greg Vassar talks about, and they like to play physical and get them out of the game, and, and they did that against Central Florida. They kept themselves in the game despite Central Florida appearing to be the team with more talented players. And they just kept battling and battling, and, and it came down to where it was incredibly sloppy. It was it was one of the sloppiest ultimate I've seen in a long time, where it almost looked like a pickup game going back and forth towards the end. But Central Florida was able to stay composed after the sloppiness, pull out a victory. And, and Vassar said, "You know what? Those are our fourth and fifth year players who are making mistakes, and there's not much else we can do." Yeah, I mean the rest of that pool. I believe I believe San Diego State went over. Um, but one of the, one of the things, uh, you know. It, it, being that West Coast team traveling down to play, traveling east to play these top teams, consolation play is just as important as bracket play. And though they won't be able to, you know, play against Tufts or play against Pittsburgh and try to beat those teams and make themselves look really good, you could still do a very good job on Sunday if you're not in the bracket. You could still come out and if you turn your team, if you turn your game around and start dominating teams or start playing really close games, you could still make yourself look really good in the rankings and you could prepare yourself to play the regionals where, you know, rank, all this ranking talk aside, all rankings do is are, are they're just a precursor for how many bids you get to regionals. Once you're at regionals, it doesn't really matter win. how you did in the regular season. You still have to get the job done. So San Diego State, tough day for them, but I mean they just need to keep developing. And if they could if they could head into regionals confident, the Southwest region it could be anyone's region. What did you see out of Dartmouth? They won Pres Day uh, a little over a month ago, and they they took a tough loss in round one to UCF. UCF won I think 15 to six or seven. Mm -hmm. uh, it was big. The rest of the day? Uh, they went out and they, they they played a close game with Wilmington. And, and Dartmouth's a team that's right there. And unfortunately for them, Queen City tune-up really, if we're talking about rankings, is really affecting them. Dartmouth is a team that's top 25, clearly. I think, I mean, there's so much parity in college ultimate. But Dartmouth, they just, they were able to beat San Diego State and that was it. And so tomorrow they have to come out with a strong performance to try to even that things out if they really want a chance. For them, if we're just talking, because we're talking about rankings so much, is that moving forward, they really have to do well at the next tournament if they're going to New England Open the, next, the following weekend where they get to play those mid-level teams and they can actually demolish them. I, I th I'm, I'm questioning whether or not Spencer Diamond coming back is a great thing. And the reason is he's a great player and he's speedy and he's quick. But I just wonder is they had a good thing going at Prez Day and you bring in a new player to that equation, how does that affect the chemistry? And, and it could be, it's just speculation there because you don't really know. But it also shows that to me that the Southwest is weaker than what people think. They have a lot of teams that are in the 20s and 30 range, but Southwest is dominant, with the exception of Stanford and California, which are definitely deserving of top 20 merit. And then in going, talking about Stanford, we can go into Pool D. The only pool that did not go to seed, but Stanford was able to hold on with a universe point win over Georgia, and that was an exciting game. 
uh, Georgia came out firing seven to four. They led over Stanford and Stanford was able to come back. We had a lightning delay, not really seen the favorite Stanford. Then Georgia went on a run and Stanford came back and ended up taking the game at the end. And so that was a, a great game. And I believe it was uh, Michigan that ended up finishing over Georgia, beating them, and then Penn State, the team that went over. Yeah, uh, the, I got to I got to see the Michigan Georgia game, and, and um, well, a couple of, uh, we we were watching it, and it seemed like it seemed like Georgia was was going to run away with it. It was 10-7 Georgia. It seemed like they they had full control of the game. It was a very tight first half. Michigan took a lead by a couple breaks. Georgia came back, took half 8-7, and it seemed like they were going to run away with the game. And then 10-7 happened. And Michigan started playing incredible defense. They started playing. They had a couple of red zone stop it, stoppings. They they were just they played super good defense. Spencer Jolly just went off, and they went on a huge run, six to one run. They beat. They won the game, 13-11, and a really a really heartbreaking day for a team like Georgia. And one of the things that I want to touch upon with a team like Ohio, who loses a heartbreaker to Tufts. Same thing with Georgia. The great thing about the rain delay was the fact that pre quarters got moved to tomorrow morning especially for those two teams like Georgia and Ohio who just lost two very heartbreaking losses. They don't have to play right now. They get to go home, they get to shower, they get to get warm, they get to eat, relax, figure out what went wrong, and come out tomorrow more confident. If they had to play games right now, Ohio looked gas. They, could, they probably could have lost. And Ohio's a really good team. They deserve to be in the quarters. They deserve to be in the discussion. So I think while it sucks that we don't get to see a pre-quarters game under the lights, it's, it's really good for those teams to refuel, re-energize, and come back tomorrow with clear heads. Definitely. New day tomorrow. Yeah, new day tomorrow. And, and who do you guys like going into it? Pittsburgh. I mean, Pittsburgh, <laughs> I think, is, is the clear number one at this tournament. They've got a lot of weapons on offense, and they're figuring out more and more how to use them. Um, if I'm their coach, what I would like to see better tomorrow is in zone offense. They, they you saw a lot of hammers uh, that set up scores, a lot of guys just kind of cutting haphazardly. They don't have very good stack discipline, and, and if they add that to the mix, they're going to be even more dangerous. So I think they look good. I think Tufts is strong. Uh, battling through today um, and coming out with those wins is impressive. Um, so those would be my top two, the top two seeds. I think they're they're that for a reason. I think Tufts d d is, is, is probably going to end up in the finals just because of how they're playing. Um, the one thing that I can question is I think Tufts, Tufts can stick with the big teams. They, I think they were able to play Oregon close because at Centex, but because Oregon, they lost, they lost Ian Campbell pretty early in that game. It was pretty windy conditions that Oregon didn't seem to be handling very well. And they also didn't have Aaron Hahn. They didn't have their complete team. I think with Stanford invite conditions, I think it would have been a completely different game. And because of that, I'm not sure if Tufts can hang with a team like Pittsburgh, who just has has so many weapons. I mean, who, who does who does Jack Hatchet guard? You know, you, you shut down you shut down Alex Thorne, there's Max Thorne. You shut down Deidre Allimore, there's both Thorns. So it's just like, who can shut those guys down? A dark horse team, someone that's going to come in and maybe surprise a few people, maybe, maybe end someone's day early, Stanford. I think Ben Funk is one of the best players in college ultimate right now, and Jordan Jeffries is a very talented player as well. They, they definitely could go far. And then if you're looking at other teams that could be a surprise coming up, you know, you might think Georgia, even though they had that loss, the problem is with them, and we just mentioned this, Elliot Erickson went down with a hamstring injury against Stanford. And that's actually a guy, is, as soon as I mentioned this, is he wears sweatpants to keep the hamstring warm and loose. And one of the first plays of the game, unfortunately, went down. And then after that, we're going to see some interesting matchups. I'd love to see if Michigan can make it through pre-quarters. I believe they're facing Illinois. I could be wrong about oh, that's, that. That's unfortunate yeah, for the Great Lakes, Great Lakes region. But Michigan goes on to face UCF. Trey Stoddard, Jolly, do we see that matchup? They're big guys. I don't know. Jolly isn't the, necessarily the most athletic guy in that sense, but a big size guy. Body. you, you got to think the body's going to match up. I think you're more likely to see a Michael Hickson versus Spencer Jolly matchup because Trey Stoddard and, and Jolly are both offensive players. The thing that, that worries me about UCF, and I, you know, I've, I've liked them throughout the whole season, the thing that worries me about them is they seem to be more of a team without Frey They seem to be more, you know, for the first time all season, I, and also I saw videos of them at CCC, they were really using the full width of the field. They were using all of their players. Quint Wharton, Kyle Bettis were playing very strong games. John Best was playing very smart. Ryan Nation, uh, Matt Nation's playing very smart. With Frey they seem to rely on him a lot, you know, either sending a deep to him or having him work the under, and then they, they start just sticking to half the field or a third of the field. So I, I really, I'm worried about them in terms, in terms of him coming back. So uh, my big prediction is if we don't wrap this up, the battery's going to die. <laughs> so uh, I think that, yeah. Thanks for uh, listening in. This is Brian Jones, Zach Smith, Jonathan Neely. Yeah. Be sure to tune in for day two for all our coverage. Thanks yeah. for joining. Thanks.